Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our April 3rd Thursday um, R&D committee meeting presentation. Um, it's good to have you here. We're, uh, you can see Jose has had um, substantial bud break behind him there. Uh, I hope everyone else is in that same position. <laughs> um, before we get started with Jose's presentation, I just want to remind everyone that we have an irrigation um, uh, tailgate presentation coming up on, on May 2nd. So that's a Tuesday, um, 1.30 at Tin Horn Creek Winery and three o'clock at Kismet Estate Winery. And that's put on by the Great Growers Association. It's um, $25 for BCGA members just to cover cost. And um, so register, you need to register. You can't just show up and, and sooner than later. Um, so as soon as this presentation is over, register. I think that's a good plan. Um, Jose is going to present on, on grapevine diseases from nursery to <laughs> vineyard, sustainable management of grapevine trunk diseases. Um, I told Jose he has a very long bio. I might make it interactive, but um, Dr. Jose Ramon Urbez Torres is a research scientist at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Summerland Research and, De and Development Centre in um, Summerland and serves as an adjunct pr professor at the biology department at UBCO and is a research affiliate at the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute at Brock. He received a postdoctorate, postgraduate master's degree in Viticulture Enology and Wine Marketing in 2001 from International Social Science Council and the degree of Agriculture Engineering in 2004 from the University of Valladolid in Spain. See, this is where it needs to be interactive, Jose. He's <laughs> <laughs> good, he's good. You're grinning over there, I don't know. Uh, uh, Jose obtained a PhD in, okay, so I'm gonna say it the way I say it about my daughter, a PhD? in plant pathology in 2009 from uh, UC Davis. He has studied diseases of woody perennial crops, primarily grapevines, tree fruits, and nut crops since 1999. And his current research focuses on the development and implementation of sustainable management practices for fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases of grapevines and tree fruits in Canada. He served as president of the International Council for Grapevine Trunk Diseases from 2019 to 2022, and he's the current regional representative for that organization for North America. And Jose was awarded in 2020, congratulations, with the Early Career Award by the American Phytopathological Society Pacific Division for his outstanding contributions to science in the area of plant pathology and crop protection. Okay, we're, um, I guess we're, to, we're ready for our Q&A period now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, welcome, Jose. And, Thank you very uh, much, Kathy. I'm gonna send the presentation. Okay. Okay, uh, everybody is able to see the presentation, can hear me well. Yeah, good. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy, for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, the research we have been conducted in the past five years, or part of the research. Uh, the title is "From Nursery to Vineyard: Sustainable Management of Grapevine Trunk Diseases," and this. Uh, research is uh, activity 21 from the Canadian Agricultural Partnership of CAP program that was funded uh, from 2018 to 2023. And these are the people who have been contributing to this, to this work. So I am the project leader along with uh, my colleague, Dan Gorman, uh, my research technicians here at the Summerland Center, Julie Boulay, Melanie Walker, Jane Tillman, uh, we have two great uh, graduate students, uh, Jer Raikan, PhD student, and Jinx Polar Flaman, who is a master student on this project. Uh, all our collaborators that have been able to uh, help me on, on all these years getting, getting work done. Uh, you know most of them Tom Force, Pat Bowen, Kevin Nasser, Laurie, uh, Carl Bogdanov, and David Neal from Summerland Research Station. 
at UBCO, Miranda Hart and Tania Fugel, and also international collaborations I work with uh, Dr. David Gramaje from Spain and Marcel Snosky in Australia, who are uh, two of the leaders and more knowledgeable people on, on trans diseases. So we are lucky to have them uh, as science advisors. So as an outline, uh, I'm going to start. Uh, many of you are familiar, but some of you may not know too much about trans diseases. So very brief introduction about what are trans diseases and why do we care for, for these diseases? Uh, and I will focus on two main parts of what this project uh, within the CAP program uh, was for this past year. One was a study, the health status of the nursery material coming to Canada and what are the implications for that uh, to growers. And I will focus you know, the rest of my presentation on some of the control studies that we have developed and been able to implement successfully, I can say here in, in British Columbia. So to start, uh, grapevine trans diseases are caused by many different fungi, um, and that's one of the disadvantages of these diseases. Uh, this disease is not powdery mildew, which we can, you know, have one product to control one pathogen. These diseases uh, have, you know, many different fungi. They are going to infect grains through pruning wounds and openings. So as you know, we need to prune grapes every, uh, every year to get a crop. So we are actually favoring the entrance of these uh, pathogens into our vines. Uh, most of the symptoms include a slow or rapid decline. And you can see here's an example of a cordon completely infected and declining on, on the vine. And you can see these uh, internal uh, perennial cankers where the fungus is colonizing the, the xylem. Um, this rapid or slow decline will depend on the type of fungi that invade those plants uh, and the disease but will end, of course, on eventual death of the, of the vine. Uh, these diseases occur wherever plants are, uh, grapes are planted, and their prevalence you know, and incidence may depend on the geographical locations, but they are uh, worldwide distributed. So we have two main groups of trans diseases, those affecting young vineyards uh, within the five years after planting. We can see here some of the symptoms in the vascular discoloration and poor vigor and poor growth caused by this fungi. We have black foot and petri disease, and this uh, disease is caused what we know as the yam vine decline complex, and it's caused by a many different group of fungi. In mature vineyards, we have mostly what we know as canker diseases because the main symptoms they cause is this canker formation I mentioned before. And we have ESCA, Botosphere dieback, Eutypha dieback, and Formosis dieback. Just to give you an idea, I think right now is over 80 different fungal pathogens that have been associated with all these complex. So why do we care for these diseases? These are some uh, studies conducted in California by Dr. Kaplan. Uh, and we can see here in this graph, the incidence by age of the vineyard. So of course, you know, we are gonna have more infections as the vineyard is getting mature, more pruning wounds are done in those uh, vines. So after year four, five, six infection start, and you can see how gradually does incidence go uh, in the vineyard. At the same time, uh, when we get this infection, production is start declining. Uh, we are start losing uh, spare positions in our in our cordon. So uh, by year uh, eight or nine, we can lose up to twenty percent. By year fifteen, uh, studies done in California have shown that we can lose up to seventy to eighty percent production if we have a severe infection. This would be the ideal yield that we got, you know, continuously in our in our blocks. So there is no doubt that this disease causes significant impact. In France, have been reported that only one disease known as ESCA uh, currently affects 12% of the French vineyards, which made them uh, economically unsustainable, uh, almost 100,000 hectares with a cost of 1 billion euros. Growers in California spend about more than 260 million a year to fight with these diseases. And another economic study in Australia uh, showed that up to one and a half ton per hectare only on Syrah, you know, uh, caused by these diseases, which translated in almost 3,000 Australian dollars per hectare. So quite, quite significant. So in Canada here, we have seen symptoms of SER since the early 1900s and, and before it was known as the dead arm disease. The first report was in uh, uh, Ontario in the mid 60s. That's the first official report in Canada of some of these pathogens in, on grapes. Uh, in Ontario and Quebec, we have some reports, but mostly these are associated to studies conducted in Northeast United States, where they have actually sampled some of the grape growing regions in Ontario and Quebec, but we don't really have 
a very deep knowledge of the situation of these diseases in those provinces. Uh, they are much better known here in BC. We have been working on trying to understand this disease since 2010. And some of the, our results you know, show that uh, actually 95% of the vineyards we surveyed between 2010 and 2014 show some vines or vines with symptoms of trans diseases. Around 10% of the vines that we uh, surveyed, uh, we estimated have trans diseases. And there was a significant um, variability on the incidence. We have up to 38% of infected plants in young vineyards or some of our uh, mature vineyards had over 80%. We have been able to identify 40 different fungi causing trans diseases here in British Columbia. And this is just a plot of the incidence with the vine of the uh, vine age. Here in British Columbia, we can see uh, the first five years, we have some of these vineyards with up to 40% incidence. This would correspond to what we just mentioned about the young vine decline. We can see here this period between five and 15 years with most of the vineyards with a low incidence. This is where we believe most of the infections start happening. Our vineyards start getting more mature, more pruning wounds, infection start. And as the vineyards get older, infection increase with some of the oldest vineyards having up to 80% infection. So the life cycle, so we have two main uh, uh, important source of infection. The first one is that uh, these pathogens can come with the contaminated nursery material. And I will talk a lot about that in my next section. So they can be planted in our vineyards. They can be introduced in the vineyards. But for example, in the vineyard, when the plants are infected, eh, they develop these fruiting structures in the infected areas. These fruiting bodies contain the spores. Under environmental conditions, these spores are released. And they are going to, again, colonize pruning guns, develop the canker formation, and the life cycle continue and slowly start degrading and, and um, uh, causing the decline. However, we have other sources of inoculum. These pathogens also uh, have a very wide host range. And here in British Columbia, we have found them very commonly on cherry and apple. And as we know, cherry and apple are planted next to vineyards. So that's another source of infection, but also happen in native plant communities. We have found this here in the in the Okanagan and in Russian olive, you can find them even in ponderosa pine, uh, in, in shade. So it has a very, very wide uh, host range. That's also one of the disadvantages to control these uh, pathogens. So our first, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the, the work we did trying to understand the status of the nursery material and the implications that that has for our industry here in, in BC or in Canada. So it has been widely reported that this fungi can be present on, on nursery material. And this is some of the infections that we have observed, some of the material coming here to, to be seen. However, most of the studies have focused only on the presence of absence of this fungi, whether they are there or not. However, our question, and you will understand that when, when I go through my results, is is really the presence of the fungus result or is gonna result on the plant death of, of that material, you know? We rely entirely on imported nursery material. We have a very small domestic production. So most of our material is coming from certified uh, sources from the CFIA and those are nurseries from Germany, France and the United States. So those are the places that can sell material into Canada and only the nursery certified by CFIA can sell into Canada. So our question is, we really wanted to know the health status of the ready to plant material here in Canada. And for that, we were able to contact five different nurseries. They, they were very kindly to provide a plant material. And I'm talking here about the ready to plant. So these are the plants that the grower will receive from the nursery. So we have 30 plants per nursery and those were Chardonnay, Merlot and Pinot Noir on 3309C. So we wanted to check the same cultivars on the same rootstock. And, but one nursery, we have cell rooted material. We develop an entire uh, detection and quantification system, and that's the difference of our study. We were not only detecting all these five different uh, fungi. These are the most common and prevalent uh, fungi causing the jump in decline. So we were able with the droplet digital PCR, not only to detect it, but quantify. And what I'm showing you here in this uh, figure is each of these uh, columns is a different plant, and you can see a lot of blue dots here. So each dot is a positive for one of our targets. Okay? So you can see here that this plant, for example, has a significant amount of infection. Other plants 
don't have any infection or less infection. So we are able to know exactly the absolute quantification of that fungus in the plant. So as uh, overall results here, uh, sorry, the table is a little bit busy, but what I want you to, to focus is first, uh, those are the different uh, nurseries and all the uh, pathogens that we uh, tested. First, we have 100% of the plants were infected. There was only one plant in nursery D that we were not able to detect uh, this pathogen, but also take into consideration that we are uh, targeting five uh, different uh, pathogens and we have over 40 or 50 you know, that can be present. So uh, all the plants have at least one of these fungi you know, with an average of three fungi per plant. And if you go for the different pathogens that we were checking, you can see a lot of 190% across the board for many of the nurseries. And there is a huge variability, but the whole thing message is all the plants were infected with at least one of these pathogens. Just to give you some more details on our results, these are the total fungal abundance per nursery. So here you have the different nurseries in different colors. These are the different uh, pathogens. And we can see, again, a significant variability depending the pathogen in nursery. For example, nursery A and have a significant amount of Salmonella and Cadophora. Uh, nursery E, for example, have a very low amount of Salmonella. Uh, contrary had, you know, nursery E have a higher amount of Botrysphaeria and Cadophora. Overall, Cadophora was the most prevalent uh, pathogen in all the nurseries, but you can see in this graph how much variability depending the nurseries uh, and the, the, the pathogens found. So another thing we did is we were uh, collecting different sections, roots, the basal part of the rootstock of the cell-rooted material, graph union and scion. And here we saw, for example, Phimoniella, we can find it almost in all different parts of the plant, but just for area, mostly, you know, in the graph union of the scion, Cadophora, again, in most of the plants, and Ilionectria, which are a soil-borne uh, fungi, uh, we mainly find, in, of course, on the base and on the roots. But again, we can have a significant variability and abundance from these pathogens in the different sections. Total abundance per cultivar, eh, again, eh, we don't have really a clear pattern. Eh, as you can see, eh, most of the, of the cultivars were infected, eh, in this case, um, we can see, for example, Pinot Noir had the highest amount of Simoniella or Cadophora. Uh, Chardonnay, in this case, have a lot of Cadophora and Simoniella, lower Botrysphaeria, but there is not a clear pattern, you know, depending on the cultivar. Okay? So basically, uh, as I said before, and continues the, the, the same pattern, they, they are very, very um, uh, widely distributed. Just to give you an example, what we can find from 10 plants from the same nursery, and this is only on Phimoniella chlamydospora and the different parts you know, of the plant. And you can see how even plants within the same nursery can totally uh, vary. With these plants, for example, high, have a very high amount you know, of the pathogen. Some other plants like plant 10 have a much lower amount of the pathogen. So just wanted to give you an idea of the wide distribution that we can find with this uh, uh, fungi in nursery material. We have the same nursery that we sampled in two different years, 2014 and 2018. And while the percentage of plants infected didn't change from year to year, all the plants were infected with at least one pathogen. What we observed was that the pathogens were in a different abundance. You know, in 2014, we have Phimoniella, Botrysphaeria, or even, you know, uh, Facremonium in a much higher abundance than in 2018, while Cardophora or Inonetia didn't change. So this could be, of you know changes in the nursery process that they have been improved you know and trying to get maybe more sanitation in the nursery process or just because the plants are coming from different mother blocks and those mother blocks have a much less infected uh, material but at the end we got the same amount of infection we measure also the necrosis at the base of the rootstock and this is something that uh, many growers uh, can do when the, the the material come they can just make a cut at the base of the rootstock uh, just above the roots. And this has been always shown like um, an indication that the material is infected. And I just saw you here, two pictures, and I'm gonna explain you what we got here. So we correlate the amount of fungi with the necrosis. Uh, and you can see here that there was no significant difference on the necrosis found at the base among the different nurseries. 
only nursery B, which is the self-rooted, has a significantly lower necrosis. Merlot and Pinot Noir, and overall, it was only about 25% of that section was necrotic versus you know, 40, uh, close to 50% from the rest. But what you can see here is there is no correlation between the amount of infection and necrosis. We have plants you know, with high uh, infection, 197 copies per nanogram, 49, but we have also, you know, very, very low infection, you know, and the same necrosis. So we didn't find a correlation between the necrosis and the amount of fungus present in those plants. And here in this picture, I showed you the plant with the highest abundance, with more than 700 copies of the targeted fungus with 50% necrosis and the plant with the lowest abundance. There was almost no fungus uh, detected in this plant, but it still have a 45, 43% necrosis. So, Necrosis is not really an indication of the amount of fungi that we can have in that plant. And this is quite a significant uh, finding because um, this necrosis may cause for other different reasons, you know, uh, than, than the fungus. So as conclusions from this part, you know, we have that 99% of the plants screen contain at least one trans disease. This fungal species abundance vary between nurseries, cultivars, plants from the same nursery and between different sections of the plant. There were no difference between rootstock and self-rooted uh, material, no infection difference between plants from the same nursery from different years, and the necrosis at the base of the rootstock or self-rooted cultivar didn't correlate with fungal abundance. So what are the implications of this for us? So we have this model that we were uh, adapted from uh, a publication from Shiver et al. in 2007. So here we have the fungal colonization and uh, the colonization threshold of the fungus. This is the natural death of the plant. So we expect a plant with no stress in the natural conditions is gonna have the life cycle going and the fungal colonization is gonna be reached at the end of this natural plant uh, life. So our hypothesis is if these plants are infected and under stress conditions, we are gonna observe a premature death if we have you know, a single infection. And our hypothesis is if they are infected both by more than one fungus uh, under stress conditions is gonna be having more uh, premature death dying early. Why we say that? Because we believe that either abiotic or biotic stress factors are gonna be influenced, you know, in whether these plants, as we saw, they are all infected, they are all coming with the pathogens, are gonna have a direct influence on developing disease. So we have been working on different experiments, looking into abiotic or biotic stress factors in both nursery and under field conditions. And we are focusing on all these different types of stress. Today for time, <laughs> I don't have time to present everything. I will show you some of the results we got with the, with the water stress. So the idea is, is the presence of the fungus may not result on disease and eventual death. If we have 100% of the material coming from nurseries infected, or at least with the presence of this fungi, we, we will not have viticulture as we know if it means that every single plant is gonna die. And that's what that's, we don't see that on the field. And also maybe the amount of fungus in, in that plant is gonna determine whether or not the plant can defend itself. If we have a very high inoculum, maybe the plant uh, cannot defend itself and it's gonna develop disease early, but maybe plants with a very low amount of inoculum, the plant is still gonna be able uh, uh, to, to, to thrive. So. And that's what we have been shown with the amount of different inoculum observed. So in order to do these experiments to try to mimic what is happening uh, in, in nature, what is coming from nursery, we develop a bacterial inoculation system. So basically we use this pathogen, Fermonella chlamydospora. We um, apply the vacuum at the top of the canes. We basically vacuum spore suspension. So we have different amounts of spores you know, through the entire cane and with our detection system, we were able to detect uh, all the pathogens through the cane. So we are able to get the pathogen all the way up to even 20 centimeters, but as you can see, the majority part of the pathogen gets in the first node. And that is actually where we see most of the material coming uh, infected from, from the nursery. So once we have this developed, we uh, completed a two-year greenhouse experiment. This is to look into the water stress. So these are our plants were uh, infected with the Famonella chlamydospora. They were subjected to stress or no stress. So we, we got a very uh, nice stress in the greenhouse. You can see here some of the scorching of surf at the edge of the leaves. So <clears throat> this is uh, the leaf water stream potential uh, that 
clearly separate, you know, and we can see the stress. And we have also the soil uh, tensiometers that we can see a significant difference, you know, on the soil moisture between stress and not stress. So we were successful to imply a stress on these plants. And what we observe is, of course, plants under stress have less known numbers, lower pruning wave, lower root wave. But most important, we were able to show that uh, stress increased the amount of fungi in those plants from original infection. So water stress actually promoted fungal growth. We have much more fungal growth in plants under stress than plants without stress. So that's what we were trying to, uh, so at least under this, these greenhouse conditions, we were able to demonstrate that these vines under stress infected, they may reach this premature death much earlier. However, I have to say that we didn't see any symptoms of young vine decline in the greenhouse, but we were able to demonstrate that the fungus was able to, uh, to grow. So we have a <clears throat> experiment in the field. And right now we wanted also to see what is this under natural field conditions. So we have a Merlot uh, block that we planted and we artificially inoculate with a high and low inoculum of spores. So some plants will have a high inoculum or the low inoculum. Try to understand also what really means to have plants infected with higher or lower as we were seeing from the nursery. Plants were either subject to water stress. J rooting is another uh, stress factor. Uh, if, if you are familiar with J rooting, sometimes when you plant the material, whether the material is uh, not planted properly or there is a hard pan at the bottom, these roots bounce back and is known as uh, stress. We have extreme heat and that we were able to conduct by um, covering the, the treatment plants with uh, plastic. So we were able to get these very high stream conditions um, in the plant. And we have also uh, another treatment with nematodes. So again, uh, this uh, experiment is still ongoing. We wanted to harvest the whole experiment last year, but because we had some delays, as well as the situation with the pandemic, we have decided to have one more year of experiment. So all the data will be um, uh, obtained in September, October of this 2023. We wanted to have at least three years data. Some of the phenotypical observations we have uh, observed at the end of this past year, the effect of water stress on disease development. We see that the plants who have a very high amount of spores inoculated, whether they are under no stress or stress, they develop symptoms at the end. And these are the typical symptoms for young vine decline. All these uh, necrotic uh, um, red leaves that basically there is a blockage in the vascular system. But interestingly, only the plants who were under stress were showing system with a very low amount of spores in the, in the plant. And we can see here the difference. So again, uh, these are only phenotypical observations and not all the plants. We have a certain number of plants that happen this, but we can see here that first, look like the amount of spores really matters. If it's very high, doesn't matter if the plant is under strength or not, it's gonna develop disease. And if there is a stress, only those so far with a low amount were uh, developing symptoms. Similar results we have observed with the J rooting, uh, spores, high amount of spores, whether they were J rooted or not, so symptoms, but only those under J, J rooting treatment with low spores were showing the symptoms. And finally, the same with our heat, extreme heat treatment. Those plants, you know, uh, that they were high uh, infection and their ambient temperature, we saw that they started to develop symptoms, but only those that they had low spores at extreme versus the ambient temperature developed symptoms. So uh, as conclusions for this part, so we have developed and implemented an inoculation system, mimics natural infections. We developed the digital PCR for absolute quantification, uh, which allow us to better understand what is really happening in, in, in the plants. Uh, plants under water stress conditions in the greenhouse saw an increase in fungal growth. So we uh, can say that under these conditions, water stress is a, a factor that can uh, favor disease development. Phenotypical observations on the field conditions show a high inoculum plants to develop disease, uh, whether they, with, with and without stress, while the low inoculum plants only develop symptoms under stress conditions. Pathogen presence may not imply plant mortality, and that's one of the things that we wanted to reiterate here. And these stressors may be the, the trigger of having these pathogens transitioning for maybe being latent pathogens in the plant to be built. 
So I'm gonna, the last uh, part of my presentation, uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the control strategies we have been working here in BC, both cultural and biological control. So diseases are, uh, the, there is no resistant uh, cultivar to trans diseases. They are all susceptible. Uh, uh, there are different levels of susceptibility. For example, we know Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc are way more susceptible than Merlot, for example, but all the plants are susceptible. Uh, effective products used in the past are no longer available for different reasons. And they have been phased out or, or they are basically um, not produced anymore. Uh, but right now there is no products available to control the once the plants are infected. Once this canker, these fungi are inside the plant, we cannot spray anything to stop that infection. And the only thing we have is the remedial surgery that I will talk later. So the control study is basically focused on uh, prophylactic. We need to protect these pruningoons. As I mentioned at the beginning, the pruningoons are the main point of entrance for these pathogens. So we need to protect these pruningoons. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about epidemiology. And this is some studies that we conducted in California to try to understand um, the environmental factors and when the inoculum is present. So for example, under California conditions, we can see that most of the inoculum correlates with the winter rains eh, in fall and winter. And as soon as uh, late uh, spring, early summer, we don't find the, the inoculum. So high spore abundance from late fall to midwinter. So pruning wound protection is essential during that period. That's one of the parts that most pruning happen in California. And delay pruning in California, if you can delay the pruning a little bit, you know, until um, uh, I would say February, uh, we have a significant reduction of the infection just because uh, we have a very long part here with no infection under California conditions. However, the situation here in this is very different. And these are studies that we have conducted um, throughout the valley. Here you can see the total amount of spores. Eh? These are the temperature and precipitation. So we found that our first uh, spores counts are actually end of the winter, early spring. So now uh, about uh, end of March, April, that's the first time we are finding our spores and correlates more with temperature than precipitation. So as soon as we are entering into above freezing temperatures, you know, we have actually the optimum conditions for that. We are having a very dry spring, so I'm not expecting a lot of spores to be in the environment right now, but this is our time right now for getting the first load. And of course, as we can see here, those these pruning wounds are gonna be, uh, they need to be protected. And our results show that we can have a spore loads all the way until almost end of July. So we have um, at least three to four months where spores can be present in the environment here under busy conditions. So. Compared to California, eh, it's very clear that delaying the pruning is not gonna work eh, because we are getting most of our uh, infection happening now, you know, basically when, when most of the people are, are, are pruning. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the highest spore abundance, we have it from late winter to early spring. Most pruning, most pruning here in BC is completed actually during that time. So there is no doubt that these pruning goods are gonna be, they need to be protected. So late pruning is not effective under busy conditions, but our question is what about early pruning in BC? And we did an experiment in our research block where we were inoculating, you know, with the spores of these two uh, trans disease pathogens. So here I'm showing the different pruning dates. So here we have, we prune once uh, every month from December to April. And here you have the inoculation time. So for example, when we prune in December, and we come back and inoculate those pruning wounds in March, yeah, we have uh, about, three, uh, about three months that those pruning wounds are, four months these pruning wounds are uh, open and start healing. And we can see that early pruning overall have a much lower infection uh, with both pathogens uh, than we are start pruning in February, March, or April. So for example, if we prune in February and we inoculate the day after in February, almost 90% of those pruning wounds are infected. If we prune in March, you know, and we inoculate basically the day after in March, this is when most of our spores will come, eh, almost eh, over 90% of those spores will come. In April, similar situation. So we have shown that early pruning can minimize between 40 and 80% infection. 
Another thing we have been working is with the remedial surgery, uh, and that's the only way we have to eliminate the pathogen from the plant. So basically remedial surgery, we identify a plant is infected, we start cutting until we find healthy wood, and there is no more canker of infection, and we are able to retrain that plant. So there are different advantages and disadvantages. You know, the advantages is, of course, uh, we have a very well-developed root system. We can fast enter in production, as I will show now. And the major disadvantage is the cost. You know, it's, a, it's highly cost to do this work, but you have to put into uh, balance how much also will cause you to remove the entire vineyard, replant, and wait at least two, three years for production. So. So we have an experiment that we have done six years actually in Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir. And this experiment came to us because the grower actually was observing uh, in the vineyards a significant decrease in yield. We can see here that after 2012, 13, the yield was decreasing significantly. So he was very worried uh, what was the cause of this decline. So when we went to the vineyard and we start looking into the vines, it was very clear that the main reason was um, grape vine trunk diseases. So we made cuts in those vines and we can see the top part, all the canker infection, and the bottom part. So we have an average of almost 40% of the area compromised at the top and about 30% of the area compromised at the bottom. So <clears throat> if, we, if we look into remedial surgery, uh, we, we will say that infection is already at the bottom. So these plants are compromised and eventually will die. But if I tell that to the grower where we have you know, about uh, 80 acres with this situation, the question of the experiment changed here. And the question of the experiment is, can we do trunk renewal, even though we know the infection is at the bottom and try to see how long we can keep these plants alive eh, eh, producing. So the grower has a time frame, you know, to start developing a replanting uh, plant. So the vines were renewed in 2016, 17, and we have 30 vines. Uh, renew per block and 30 vines uncut. So basically we left the original vines during the time of the experiment. So these are some of the results in the Pinot Noir and we didn't get uh, results from 18 and 19 because the grower harvests before letting us know. So we lost these years, but what we can see here is even the year after we conducted these cuts, we already had some production in those vines. In 2020 and 2021 primary, the production was higher, but I have to say that if you remember 2020 and 2021 have been probably one of the most uh, hardest years, you know, with the heat dome, the, the wet spring we had. So overall yields were significantly low. We can see in 2022, how our treated vines significantly increased the amount of yield versus the infected ones we left. In terms of uh, quality parameters, bricks, pruning weights, TA, pH, there were no significant difference between the treatment and the untreated vines. So even the fruit you are getting this first year from the treated vines have the same quality parameters than the untreated vines. This is very, very similar to the Pinot Gris. In this case, in the Pinot Gris in 2019, so uh, two years after we made the cuts, we already obtained a significant amount uh, of more yield than in the uncut vines. Similar situation, 2020, 2021, overall yields were lower. 22, that was our last year of the experiment. Again, a significant increase in yield and no difference with the um, quality parameters. So to put it in perspective, I think that was a very significant and successful experiment. When we started this experiment, the grower was getting about 5,000 kilos per hectare in the Pinot Noir and 7,500 7, kilos per hectare on the green. At the end of the experiment, these vines were producing more than double. Uh, or double in the case of the Pinot Gris. So renewing those vines uh, brought again um, the, the, the vineyard to production. Uh, this here, we are pretty sure also uh, is because the, the conditions we have in those years with the heat dome, et cetera, I would have expected to have a little bit more yield earlier, but uh, it was quite significant to see that increase in yield. So, we know that these plants eventually will die because the infection is at the bottom already, but uh, the grower right now has a plan to start replacing five, 10% of their blocks slowly because also the difficulties where are you gonna find plant material to replace such amount of blocks. So, uh, and at the same time, you know, it's gonna have a significant amount of, of yield. One thing the grower mentioned to me is 
one of the major significance, not only in yield, is how even the vineyard was in terms of phenology, bud break, um, bloom, variation. We have a much, much even block, which is nicer to work as you. So as conclusion, so we need to understand the epidemiology. Early pruning in British Columbia can reduce infection between 40 and 80%. Remedial surgery is very effective and we can increase production after three to four years. And remedial surgery can be used even when plants are infected past the final cut in order to gain time to put in place an effective and economically feasible repair to plant. So this is the last part of my presentation regarding some of the biological control. Uh, uh, and we are gonna talk about the pruning wound protection. So we have um, different types that we can protect pruning wounds. We have paints and, and paste. It's a physical barrier as you can see here. And yes, that physical barrier is gonna avoid the fungus to penetrate. Uh, it's pretty good for large wounds and the, the, the main disadvantage, they need to be hand applied. And it, it has a very significant cost if we have to apply those, those treatments by hand. So of course the industry is moving more towards application with a fungicide, tractor spray. We can apply to all wounds. Um, we can uh, treat very large acres, you know, in less time. So we are thinking right now, saying as we are putting our powdery mildew sprays, we can put uh, our pruning wound protection sprays. And it has, of course, a lower cost and possibility also of more than one application, which is gonna be important. If you remember, uh, I saw you that we can have between three and four months with inoculum present in our vineyard. So we may need more than one application to control those, those pathogens. And then organic, uh, well, uh, I, I say here reliability because there is a lot of um, controversy on the uh, effectiveness of biological control. We have studies with a very high success, but at the same time, studies with using the same even biological control agents with not so much success. So there is still something that needs to be um, investigated. Uh, we can achieve a long-term protection, and I will show this now with biological control. And of course, you know, sustainable organic production, that is one of the main goals um, that the, the BC grape wine industry has, you know, this sustainable production. I, I, I will not mention only organic, but sustainable uh, in general. So the difference we have with other countries is we have absolutely nothing registered in Canada, you know, while, for example, I just have some examples on California and Australia, the amount of products, both uh, chemical or biological, they have registered. So we are way behind on that here in, in Canada. So we start to work uh, with uh, one of my master's students, uh, Dean Spolar Plaman, and our main objective was to try to identify and develop some biological control agents locally sourced from British Columbia. One of the problems we have with biological controls is we may bring a product from a, a company uh, overseas or even within Canada, but that biological control is from a completely different climatic region. And it has been even developed to control disease in a, in a, in a different crop. So I've seen colleagues of mine uh, trying to use biological control on tomato to put on grapes. So all these things um, we wanted to, to avoid and we wanted to really look for uh, biological control agents from here, from British Columbia. <clears throat> so we conducted uh, both laboratory greenhouse and even field trials to uh, determine the potential of this in, in BC. So first we were able to identify seven different species of trichoderma here in British Columbia. Uh, these are taken from grapes in vineyards in British Columbia. Um, we have two new species that we describe uh, to the scientific community, trichoderma canadense and viticola. And this work has been published uh, last year in the Journal of Fungi, it's free of download and you can see um, the, the results of this work. So one of the things we had is, because we have 28 different isolates we have to, to work on, we wanted to discriminate which ones are the best to move into the next steps. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, very time consuming to have a, a field trial with 28 isolates. So one of the things we did is first is a, what we call the dual culture antagonism assay. So basically we challenge, you know, the the trichoderma with the pathogen, and we measured the percentage of mycelium inhibition. So of course, the more mycelium inhibition is translated to a major efficacy of our biological control. So these are some results for two of the main pathogens we have here in British Columbia. And we can see actually that all of our isolates by one 
reach more than 50% inhibition of the mycelium growth. But you can see a significant difference, you know, at this end eh, of, the, of the figure. So these isolates have the highest. So we select, you know, these isolates to move to our next experiment. And this was in greenhouse conditions where we have developed what we call a um, detached KNSA. So these are dormant canes. They are a stereophan bore uh, on a water uh, floating tray in the greenhouse. And we can mimic here basically what is uh, happening in a vineyard. We make a cut, we are able to treat it with the trichoderma and artificially inoculate it with our pathogens. So in this case, we challenge these wounds 24, seven days and 21 days because we wanted to know also how long that trichoderma is able to protect the pruning. And, and sorry, I'm going a little bit fast with the methodology. Uh, I wanted to focus more on the results, but if you have any question, you can uh, ask later or email me if you want more details on the, on the methodology. I have to say also we challenge with 5,000 spores and this is a very, very high inoculum. In nature, most likely this amount of inoculum is not gonna happen per boon. So we are actually overestimated uh, our, our infection. So the results we got here overall, these are our controls, non-treated but inoculated. So we have a good infection in our canes. So we saw three main species, Atropylide, Asperoides, and Canadense, had you know, almost 80% 24 hours after they were uh, infected, but we reached almost 100%. All the pruning wounds were protected even 21 days later. So this tell us that these three species are uh, with a very high potential of biological control, and we move these ones to the next step, which would be the field trial. We have other species that, you know, they didn't reach such a potential, like tomentosum, for example, almost have no, no effect. So our next step was to move these three species into the field, and we have here a Merlot block in our research station that we prune uh, and Basically, what we have was our main uh, treatments. We have about 50,000 spores that uh, we, we work with the trichoderma. We conducted this study two years. And we also compare against commercially available products in other countries. So Gil seal is a tebuconazole. It's very highly effective used in Australia. And T77 is a biological control. The silver technology is actually here in, in Canada uh, that we wanted to compare the results of our locally sourced trichoderma against commercial products. The same two species, we reduced the amount of spores, eh? it's still very high for what will happen in natural conditions, but we went from 5,000 to 2,000 because we believe that um, um, in, in nature, this pressure, this disease pressure is not gonna happen. And we extended our efficacy until 60 days. So we wanted to know all those pruning wounds treated day one, if they uh, effectiveness to cover this pruning wound from 60 days. Remember when I showed you the graph with the uh, inoculum availability here in BC, we can go basically from early April until end of July with um, um, the spores in the environment. So our results for both pathogens here in 2020 and 2021, this is our controls, meaning that these were uh, non-treated but inoculated with the pathogen. And same thing, when we inoculate the pathogen the day after we prune, we have a very high uh, infection and the pruning wound susceptibility decreased as the time between pruning and infection happens. So pruning wounds that were uh, infected 60 days after pruning, they have a much, much lower. So just the natural effect of the healing of the wound is gonna uh, minimize infection, but uh, still uh, we can see some susceptibility even 60 days. So here the results are very similar for both years and we can see overall that our three products for both pathogens in both years, they are really, really comparable with our commercial standards. Uh, they have similar or even, you know, this BC3 isolate has even higher um, a pruning wound protection than our commercial standards. We can see here that even one day after when we apply the product and gets infected, we are able to get 100% protection of those um, uh, wounds. Uh, the T77, we can see that uh, it diminishes a bit, but still after 60 days, we can have 80%. And yield seal uh, in 2020, it was uh, pretty good. However, in 2021, we saw a significant decrease. So Tebuconazole worked very good for the first 21 days, and that was expected but significantly lost the effectiveness after 60 days. But as an overall take home message, we can say that our locally sourced trichoderma 
are um, very, very effective and, and having a similar or better efficacy than the commercial products. So as conclusion, so we, we can improve the health of the propagation material, uh, implement control studies in mother blocks. Uh, I would be very interested to see the status of infection in the mother blocks and how we can improve that um, health. Uh, and the stress factors can favor disease development. We have seen water stress. Uh, in this case, I, have, uh, I, I haven't been able to present all the data we have with other experiments and other stress factors. But this is very important to make understand the industry that um, when you establish a vineyard, you know, how important it is to get uh, the, the minimum amount of stress in those vines during these first years of establishment or even after you know, uh, the, the, the vineyard because it can have a, a direct impact on the disease. It's very important to understand epidemiology, and I think we have, have a very good results here, how the epidemiology is helping us to implement our control strategies. And we need a multidisciplinary and dynamic control approach. We cannot just believe, uh, put all the eggs in one basket, whether it's gonna be just the chemical. So I think we have shown that cultural practices, whether it's the remedial surgery or pruning earlier if we can, and the use of biological or even chemical control, putting all these practices together, uh, I think we have a, a very good uh, possibility to success controlling uh, these diseases. So with that, uh, I just, again, saw you one of the review papers we published in 2018, where a lot of you know, uh, uh, aspects of uh, controlling grapevine clan diseases and it's free to download. Uh, and I think with that, I thanks everyone in my team. Thanks to them for all the great work. Everything I presented here wouldn't have been possible without the work of my team. I apologize, I miss Dan Gorman here, but he's a big, big player and, and collaborator on, on all these projects, uh, helping me here in the lab. And of course, all the external collaborators that made this happen. And with that, I thank you everyone. And hopefully we have still some time for, for questions. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yes, um, I'm sure we do have questions already. Here we have from Hans. Thank, thank you, Jose. That was, it was really well presented and super interesting. Um, uh, Hans is asking, will the, the BC trichoderma isolates be available commercially in the near future? <laughs> That's our goal and we hope so. Um, and I, uh, I, I think, well, we, we we have to understand how, how much work and process may take since you discover a, a biological control until the commercial release of that. But because we have, we have all the data in place, you know, I mean, we have all the data right now in place. I think right now probably is, is to partner, you know, with, with um, or, or to work on the development of the product, you know, because it's not the same as we use the product. We use a raw uh, product, just the spores for the trichoderma on the pruning wounds. When you have a biological control product, usually comes dry on a powder. So um, those trichoderma spores have been uh, dried out. So this is what needs to be now probably work out the, the best conditions to have a product develop. Uh, I'm not an expert on product development. And for that, I think um, uh, the next step would be to partner, you know, and collaborate with some, someone who, who, who can help us to develop this product or what the government does also is we can lease, you know, this uh, isolates to, to a company that, that develops. So my, my hope is hopefully in, in, in a short future, my, that would be very, very good that we can have the first biological control product made in Canada with Canadian uh, isolates, that would be good. Saying yeah, that, cool. for example, the, the T77, the commercial product that is from Silver, from the company here, they have a, a headquarters in New Brunswick. We have provided all the data from these trials, and I, I believe they, they have the product in the pipeline for registration. This is a product that is already commercially available. Um, so um, I'm hoping that soon this product could be available for growers. I, I, I don't know the status of the registration process with the company, but. I know they wanted to push your registration with, with this product for grapes, so. so. So what are next steps for the trichoderma though? Like how, do, how does that get pushed forward? So the, the, the trichoderma, the next step would be to, to, to work on developing a product, a commercial product. You know, we cannot just uh, use a raw uh, material because this product needs to be storage, needs to be shipped. Yeah. So, and there, there are many different things needs, needs to be worked like 
the type of pH of the product, humidity, all these things to, to make this dry and powder product. If that's the way that, that the, there are other liquid products. I'm not an expert, but I think that's the next step is to, to bring, we have the isolates, we, we know they work. We know they are, they are really, really effective. So the next step is to make the product out of these isolates. How does industry push that forward? That's that's what <laughs> we do. So yeah, so so I think I think um, I, I think having 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 funding maybe for 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 that aspect, you know, to 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 partner with 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 experts on developing the product, and this is something I'm exploring even within the government. Uh, uh, we have minor use also, but I don't I don't know if that's that's the the role. But I'm exploring, we may have scientists here in the government that uh, one of the expertise is, is that. Uh, but as I said before, many times how, how we work in the government is we have the product, we have the, the, the isolates. We can lease those isolates to a company, to a private company that develops the product. And this is something I have to follow with the commercialization officer and see. That probably will speed much more the process because you have a company behind. They know what they do. They do this all the time. So we still keep, you know, the, the IP of the of the isolates and the product, but it's the company who, so we, we basically lease that, yeah. Um, can I, before we leave that subject, can I just, is there, so long-term, is there a possibility that that using, using the trichoderma will decrease the overall effect and, and eventually eliminate the pathogens in, in the block that? I, um, <clears throat> I, I, I will be very careful with the term eliminate or eradicate because of the nature of these pathogens. And we, we see how they are not only grapes, there's cherries, there's apples, there is so much, you know, host range that we can do a lot in our vineyards, but we are still gonna have this disease pressure from outside. So um, I think eradicated disease is gonna be, I, I would say it is, is not, it's not feasible, it's not realistic, but I believe uh, on time, uh, having right now cultural practices plus some of these products available, I think our vineyards will be more resilient. They will last longer. You know, our goal is to have those vineyards, you know, lasting 30, 40 years, not have to start having these problems with 20 or 15 years, even when we have seen. And our goal with this is if a grower is losing right now, maybe 100 or 200 plants per hectare that needs to be replaced, hopefully using all these practices, you are down to, 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 to five plants per, I mean, that's an example, you know, so those yeah. are the goals, but we have to be realistic that it's going to be almost impossible to eradicate the disease from, right. because of the nature of the disease. Um, next question, um, oh, is, uh, would you apply uh, pruning paste spray, paste or spray on wounds in freezing conditions of January, February? Uh, so we have shown with our epidemiology data that uh, inoculum is very, very low in during winter time, almost not existent. Um, the, the, the pathogen needs certain uh, temperature to germinate those spores that they are going to line in our pruning wound. We have done studies that you need at least eight or nine degrees uh, Celsius for germination, and we are not having those temperatures, you know, in the middle of the winter here. Mm -hmm. So with the, the fact that we have very low inoculum and that inoculum is not going to be able to, to succeed if it gets released during that time, um, applying those pruning wounds in the middle of the winter probably is, is not going to have an, an effect. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that our infections mostly happen now. Mid-March or end of the March, where there's still a lot of pruning is happening, that's when we have most of the infection in normal springs. That's when we have most of our precipitation coming now. And that's what is making the infection. So I don't think our infections happen mostly in the, in the middle of the winter. So does that protection, I will go more towards, towards the end because those wounds are going to start cracking. The pain is going to start being lost. So I think if you are deciding to do this type of protection, I will go most towards, you know, this time of the year, you know, March but to early. So um, like prune early, but then, then apply later on? Or if you prune in December, you don't need to apply? So uh, I, I would, I, I, my advice would be a combination of both. So we know that just by pruning earlier, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we reduce significantly the amount of infection, but still we get infection because the prunes are not 100% healed. I mean, we need a lot of heat to heal completely those, those pruning wounds. So if we made a cut in, in April or May, 
that cut is going to heal way much faster than when we make it in December or January because of the temperature. So we reduce significantly because we are still getting heal of the pruning wound, but not to the level that we will get later in the middle of the summer, for example. So we are reducing that, uh, but at the same time, if we are able to apply a pruning wound protection on top of that, I'm, I'm thinking we are going to really, really minimize the infection. And, and this is always, you know, like, um, I mean, we, we provide tools, but the grower is the best one who knows first the economically uh, cause of that. Well, maybe I can only afford doing the pruning earlier, or, or maybe I prefer to do the treatment later. That's why I put at the end, it's going to be a combination. It's going to be a, a holistic approach to provide the tools we know they work and a combination of those tools, you know, I think is yeah. going to help us to minimize the maximum we can. Right. Um, do, okay, so Trevor has asked two questions that maybe will be related. Um, first, he's asking um, how the trichoderma provides protection, mm -hmm. um, but also does increasing the biological diversity in the soil help reduce spore counts? Um, I, I don't know if that's wondering if there's... So, so the first question, uh, so the trichoderma um, is, is, is a genus of fungal nodes to have biological control activity, antifungal activity. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways that trichoderma works. One is basically by uh, colonization. So the idea to put our trichoderma before the pathogen comes, so as soon as we prune, we apply the trichoderma, the idea is this trichoderma is gonna fast colonize this pruning wound, is not gonna leave any niche, any space for that pathogen mm -hmm. to come and colonize. So that's a way that trichoderma works. The other way is many of these trichoderma have uh, secondary metabolized compounds, toxins that they actually, uh, or antibiotics that produce against the fungus. So they are able you know, to, to, to target the, the, the fungal pathogen. And this is a project we have right now working internally with Kevin Asher. I have a project funded by AFC. We are trying to investigate within our trichoderma here in BC if we can identify some of these secondary metabolized toxin or antibiotics that the trichoderma form, mm -hmm. because if you identify them, you can actually produce those, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, synthetically. And, and that has been done in the past. So those are the two main ways the trichoderma works in this fungus. And the second question, sorry, was about the... Um, biodiversity in the soil, does it help protect? So I think um, that that gets a much, you know, high level, bigger picture. I think we all agree that the better biodiversity we have uh, is going to improve, hopefully, the health status of our plants is going to diminish that stress. So as we have shown, anything that is diminishing the stress and is facilitating these fungi to have easier access, you know, to, to, our, to, to our graves, it would be, it would be definitely um, uh, a beneficial. Um, I, I, I don't have really right now, you know, specific examples, but overall, you know, increasing biodiversity is, is something that uh, uh, overall, I think will benefit. We have also to understand, you know, because increasing biodiversity, but maybe there are also the things we increase that they are not, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, good for, for yeah. a, a lot of studies are going on on that, yeah. so. Um, we're uh, we're over time, but I'm going to take a couple more questions. Sure, we never yeah. go over time, Jose. Um, Michael Moss is asking uh, uh, because this is very pertinent right now for specific recommendations and concerns for uh, pruning and retraining after a winter freeze event, late pruning, large pruning wounds, xylem damage, etc. So, so of course, you know, I can I can I can give my recommendation as a scientist, but then you go to the field and you see the reality, which is very different, you know. So I'm, I'm I mean I'm I'm trying to get both 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 things. So when I talk about early pruning, we know that early pruning has this effect reducing the infection. However, we know our under our conditions, uh, many girls are concerned pruning earlier because it can increase the chance of um, uh, but, you know, uh, damage mm -hmm. if we have a, a spring frost. So delaying that pruning, you're going to also delay that, you know, bad break. So, so that's one of the concerns. Yeah. Um, I would say for a grower, okay, what is more important in your block? If you are suffering every year from spring frost and bad damage, maybe early pruning is not going to work for you. It's better for you to try to delay that pruning. But if you don't have that issue and you have uh, more worry about trans diseases, maybe early pruning is going to be a good thing for you to do. Uh, when we do big wounds, that's 
that's the worst scenario we can have in the plan. I mean, all is a is it's all about a chance that a little spore or a few spores can land on a pruning wound. The bigger the wound, the bigger chance of surface area the spore can land and start infection. And also the much longer time is gonna take to heal. These big yeah. wounds takes forever to heal. So you are gonna have that wound susceptible way much more time. So in a year like this where, uh, yeah, we are all worried about what happened in December with the, with the winter uh, freeze, it's gonna be maybe a lot of big cuts and retraining and things to do. I will try, and that's the thing, you know, because we don't have really anything to treat, you know, that those big cuts. Um, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be a challenge. But the bigger the boom, the bigger risk we have on. So far, the spring is cooperating. You know, if we are start deciding to do these prunes right now, we are very dry. Uh, so I'm not expecting to have too much sports right now in the environment. But of course, mm -hmm. you know, this can change in the few next weeks. But uh, so in terms of that, is is yeah, it's, it's not a silver bullet we can use. I think everyone in their own vineyard knows that the best options, but I know early pruning is not something that many growers would use because they are more concerned about the spring fronts and you know having an early yeah. day. So. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jose. Um, that was great. Um, and for more questions, you can email Jose directly. If you don't have his email, Kate will um, send out a, a notice after this. This presentation will be up on the BC Wine Grape Council website um, probably before the end of the day. And so you can watch that or any past presentations. Um, and Jose's off on um, a sabbatical in a month. So wish him well, um, but, but he won't be, we'll still hear from him. <laughs> I'm, still still, I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still working here. I have two jobs. I have a job then and a job here. So I'm still yeah, working in both places. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's good for us. Um, next month, third Thursday is May 18th and Tanya Vogel will give a presentation on Crown Gall, which will also be very pertinent considering our, our last winter. So join us then. We'll see you then. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jose.